Welcome to Bright Now, a podcast about parenting and educating talented kids, sponsored by the Johns Hopkins Center for Talented Youth. I'm Jonathan Plucker. Parenting and educating a bright child has unique demands and raises lots of questions. Using the latest research in education, psychology, medicine, and many other fields, we'll explore the emotional needs of talented kids, ways to foster creativity, educational experiences that really make a difference for them, and much, much more. A little about me. I've spent nearly 30 years studying how to develop talent in young people. I'm the Julian C. Stanley Professor of Talent Development at Johns Hopkins, working at the Center for Talented Youth and in the School of Education. I'm also president-elect of the National Association for Gifted Children. And my most important and demanding job is being the parent of two talented children. I know how hard and yet how rewarding it can be. On this podcast, we won't focus just on problems faced by talented kids, and we won't focus only on the positive aspects. We're going to take a well-rounded approach because we all share the goal of raising well-rounded kids. So let's get to it. My guest today is Michael Matthews, a professor at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte, where he directs their academically and intellectually gifted graduate programs. He studies motivation and underachievement, among other areas. Michael joins us today from the studios of WFAE in Charlotte. Michael, welcome to the show. Hello, Jonathan. It's a pleasure to be here today. Let's jump right into it, Michael. Uh, We're going to talk about underachievement today. Just to make sure we're all on the same page, how do you define underachievement? Well, so the way that we typically talk about underachievement is it has to do with a discrepancy between what we know a child is capable of achieving and what their actual achievement is in a particular area. Where we know a kid is really bright and really talented and very capable, and yet when you look at their performance in a particular area, they're just not doing it. It's one of the most frustrating issues, I think, for teachers and parents. Uh, it it and drives so us I, crazy. Speaking of that parent's perspective, what does underachievement look like? Like, What sorts of things would a parent see that would sort of lead us to start getting frustrated? Well, so, uh, for example, if we know that our child has been a high achiever in school, has done really well in school for a number of years, and then all of a sudden one year comes along and either in one class or sometimes across the board, their grades drop dramatically and um, we don't have a good reason for that drop, well, how come now all of a sudden is the kid having trouble here? And there's a variety of, of reasons that could cause that to happen. But particularly we're talking about the motivation dimension, and it's a case where there's not any real obvious cause. kid hasn't been sleeping, for example, and just is falling asleep in class every day. That wouldn't be underachievement. But underachievement is more about when they're not motivated all of a sudden to continue doing well on something that they've always done well on before. So like, how, how prevalent is underachievement among talented students? Well, it's really hard to get a handle on because it varies a little bit with how you define it. There's a couple of different ways it can kind of manifest itself. One is it can be kind of a one-time thing where the kid has a dip maybe in one course or for one semester um, versus a more chronic underachievement where the kid is kind of just doing enough to get by and they never really seem to pull back up into that higher level of achievement that you know they were capable of when they were younger. But the estimates could be anywhere from maybe one or two out of every 100 kids to maybe as many as 20 or 30 out of 100 kids, depending, again, on on where you set the criterion for what underachievement actually is. So what what, what are some of the causes? You've touched on some of them, but I think a lot of parents and uh, especially educators, they just kind of scratch their heads and say, why is this happening? Yeah, there's a number of different causes. Uh, Some of the causes, particularly for highly able children, may come down to a lack of challenge, um, which is really kind of counterintuitive for a lot of parents and teachers because we don't really think this kid isn't doing well in school and it's because they're not being challenged enough. We kind of tend to think the opposite of, oh, they're not doing well, we should give them easier work. But if they are frustrated because they're being asked to repeat something that they've already learned previously, if they feel like their time is being wasted, then they tend to shut down and not want to participate in that. And our impulse then to move them to an easier curriculum has exactly the opposite effect. It may improve their grades, 
but it doesn't improve what they're actually learning or their engagement in what they're learning or their motivation to, to challenge themselves, which is really what we'd like to see in our children, is, is that intrinsic motivation where they really want to have themselves working on something for their own learning rather than because someone else told them they should learn it. Another one of the possible causes is students don't see a connection between school performance and their life goals, or they see a disconnect between the curriculum in school and the real-world issues or problems that maybe are what's motivating them the most at that moment. I could see a parent listening to this conversation saying, well, isn't that just being a teenager? I think it is, right? Um, But then you also have to keep in mind that many of these talented kids uh, have kind of been motivating themselves because they have not been challenged for years and years and years. Then they get to high school and they're just so tired of of basically teaching themselves that not being able to see those ready connections really becomes a problem, right? Mm -hmm. Sure. In some of the research that I've done previously looking at high ability or gifted students who have dropped out of school, um, one of the other issues is that they sometimes see a lack of caring by their teachers in high school as compared to elementary or middle school teachers who tend to be, for different reasons, a lot more supportive and warm and fuzzy and willing to go out of their way to help students make up work that they may have missed and things. Whereas a lot of times kids get to high school or sometimes even to college and all of a sudden the teacher isn't necessarily willing to bend over backwards to help that student be successful. And they can tell a a big difference there and they can really see, oh wait, you know, they don't care about me anymore like they used to and therefore why should I bother putting forth my effort if they're not going to recognize it? And so that's one of the other causes that we get. You just reminded me of one of my biggest frustrations with this topic and uh, the conversation usually goes like this. I'm talking to a friend or colleague and they say, you know, my son or my daughter, you know, they aren't doing as well as they could be in pick your topic area, math, writing, whatever. And it's either the parent or the teacher's response to it is they just need to learn to work hard. That's what the problem is. I've heard people call the kids lazy. And yet, like you hinted at before, there's this long track record of success. And then all of a sudden, this underachievement pops up. And it just it, it comes across sort of as a blame the student mm-hmm. syndrome. I think we tend to forget as adults um, sometimes that there have always been things that even ourselves we're not motivated to do. And um, we tend to set up our lives as adults in ways that we don't have to do things that we don't enjoy doing if, if possible. Um, and we forget that kids don't always have that choice or perceive that choice. But, you know, and I've, I've had this conversation with my own kids. I have three talented children. And um, sometimes you have to explain to them that, yes, this particular thing is not that motivating, but here's the reasons why you should just go ahead and do it. Part of growing up is knowing when you need to do something that you don't want to really do. And there's different strategies that kids can use and adults as well for, you know, I'm going to make myself write this report so that then I'm going to go get myself a candy bar or something. It can be something as simple as that to motivating yourself, you know, in the longer term by looking at what are my long-term goals and how does doing this thing I don't like help me get to those long-term goals. I mean, I I definitely see where you're coming from with sort of the life lessons strategy. I guess my concern there is that you have to use that sparingly just because life is really good at teaching you that lesson throughout your lifetime. Um, (laughs) But, I mean, since we're talking strategies, put yourself in the shoes of a parent who is trying to work with their child's teachers. There seems to be an underachievement issue going on. What, What are some of the approaches that you think parent should take to kind of explore options. So some of it is really just getting a sense of what is exactly going on here with my child. What is the source of their not wanting to do these things that that I would like them to want to do? If there's a specific course that they're taking that's where the underachievement's being expressed, is there a way to get into a different course or even into the same course maybe with a different teacher who has a different teaching style that's maybe more motivating? to the student. That's one approach. Even talking to the teacher and saying, hey, you know, here's how my kid would prefer to learn. Is there anything you can do to help make the assignments more like this kind of learning that my child will be more motivated and more interested to do? Some of the things that parents do that are sort of short-term 
strategies to kind of force their child to do things, in the long run, those don't turn out to be as effective uh, because they kind of engender the wrong kind of motivation. They engender more of that extrinsic motivation. I hear of parents who are paying their child, you know, some amount of money for every A on their report card. That only goes so far because in the long run, what is that really teaching the kid? That if they don't need the $20, they shouldn't bother trying to get an A or to learn anything in that course? That's not the right lesson to come out of that. Punishing the child for not getting their homework done in time, that also, again, tends to be very much imposed from without rather than what you want to develop is the child's intrinsic motivation to make them want to do things on their own. And there's other strategies that maybe are more effective for that intrinsic motivation, such as connecting what they're learning to other things, either that they already know or to other things that you know are motivating to them in terms of like, here's how this learning in this course would connect to the future career that you've told me you're interested in. You know, Michael, and, and I, as I listen to you walk through these strategies, which are great, it just occurs to me this really does come down to challenge, doesn't it? I mean, being intrinsically motivated is really hard when you could have done the work in front of you four years ago, right? I mean, right. from my perspective as a parent, if I put my parent hat on, and it's not easy, right? It's a struggle to work with your children, to make sure that they're challenged outside of school, to work with their educators, to make sure that they're challenged within school. But in, in the end, isn't this really all about challenge? I think that's a really large part of it, yeah. Education is a lot more difficult from both ends, from the student end and as well as from the teacher end. It's a lot more difficult than I think most people think of it as being. It's sort of this thing where everybody went to school, so everybody as an adult they're thinks the they're expert, an expert right? on education, <laughs> and it doesn't quite work that way. <laughs> I, I, I want to uh, shift gears a little bit. I, one strategy that I have used that I want to share, I'd love to get your thoughts on it, is what I call the grand bargain strategy. And so the example that I will use is when uh, my daughter was coming out of middle school. For whatever reason, they just did not think she was a good math student. But we knew she was really good at math, and they kept trying to place her in lower-level math classes, which made no sense to us. But for whatever reason, they just didn't want to set the precedent of every parent who comes in gets their kid bumped up. And so I, I kind of put myself in their shoes, and, and I was like, all right, let's make a deal. You put her in this class. If this doesn't go well, you can blame me, and I will fall on my sword and say I'm the worst parent in the world. It didn't work. It was a stupid idea. Of course, I had all the faith in the world that with the right support, she would do well. Um, and at the end of the first year, they sent me a letter saying, okay, we're going to put her in this class, but if this doesn't go well, this is your fault. Like the letter <laughs> said that. And then the next year, it happened again, uh, and then the third time. And now she's in high school, and she's taking advanced math classes and doing great because she did respond well to that challenge. But I think sometimes parents are a little too passive, and they don't go in and try to work on a solution, but then also be very frank that, hey, if this doesn't work, it's on me, okay? Yeah, I think there's a couple of really good points in there. I think, yes, one is definitely parents should should be willing to go and talk to schools first instead of just jumping to the conclusion of this isn't working and there's nothing I can do. Make sure that you've done everything you can to go in and talk to your teachers, talk to the administrators, try to figure out, well, what's going on here? What do we know about our child? Because parents know things about their children that teachers in schools don't. And so informing teachers in schools of here's the things that we see in our child, sometimes that can go a long way to helping support those decisions. But schools also being, you know, being bureaucracies, they do tend to want to have things be the same for everyone because that's the most straightforward, easiest way for schools to be run is if every kid is exactly the same, it works like a factory, and we don't have to do anything individual for anyone. Unfortunately, that sort of bureaucratic impulse is at odds with what we know about effective education where really matching things to what students are interested in and to their specific abilities in a specific area at a specific point in time. All those things are very important to learning being effective. Michael, you, you've also done some work looking at gender differences in underachievement. How is underachievement experienced differently by talented girls versus talented boys, or you know, is it different? 
Yeah, there are some differences in, in how it gets expressed. One of my colleagues, Laurie Flint, who is a professor at East Carolina University, uh, looked at a lot of adults who had been underachieving as students and had kind of turned their lives around in adulthood to become successful in their careers. And uh, she found that almost all of the women that she spoke with talked about kind of flying under the radar with their underachievement. They were very smart, they were capable of getting all A's, but they kind of slid by with B's and C's and didn't really draw any attention to themselves in school at all. Whereas the adults who were men who she spoke with, they talked about sort of showing off almost in school, like proving to everyone around them by their actions that they were able to get away with not doing things in school that the teacher wanted them to do, for example. You know, they remembered doing projects where they met the letter of the project and the teacher had to give them an A, but the project they did really was minimal, if any, effort at all to actually conduct, and they didn't learn anything from it, and they remembered being proud of not learning anything from it. And so one of the things that comes out of that, going back to your earlier question about the number of students who underachieve, Just going by things like grade point average and test scores, for example, looking at a discrepancy in those two things to identify students who are underachieving, seems like there's probably approximately three or four times as many male students underachieving as female ones. But it's quite possible in light of this other work that the numbers are closer to equal for males and females and that we just don't notice it in girls as much as we do in boys because they're much quieter about how that happens. Michael, I wish we had a lot more time to talk about this. I really appreciate your time. Well, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to talk to you, Jonathan. Michael Matthews is a renowned gifted education researcher and head of gifted graduate programs at the University of North Carolina, Charlotte. He joined us from WFAE in Charlotte today. Are there topics you'd like to hear about on this podcast? What worries you about your child? What fascinates you? Feel free to drop us a line at brightnowpodcast at gmail.com. That's brightnowpodcast, all one word, at gmail.com. And as always, if you enjoyed this episode, please let your friends and colleagues know about it. It really does take a village to promote talent and excellence. Tune in next time for a conversation with NPR blogger Anya Kamenetz. Her new book is about the art of screen time and technology use. That's certainly something that we all as parents worry about with our talented kids. Until then, I'm Jonathan Flucker, and this has been Bright Now. Bright Now is underwritten by the Johns Hopkins Center for Talented Youth, a nonprofit dedicated to identifying and developing the talents of academically advanced K-12 students around the world. Find us on the web at cty. Dot jhu.edu, and on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter.